Hello and welcome to this video on how to write good code. My name is William Lefosch and I'm here to give you some tips on good programming practice. So just a quick note before we begin, if you feel like the video is moving too fast, don't hesitate to pause the video or rewind and go through the material once more. Okay, let's get started. So what is good programming practice? Well, it's essentially two things. Uh, it's that you're supposed to be writing code in a way that is understandable, and it's also that you're supposed to be writing code in a way that is time effective. And why is it important? Well, one of the most important reasons is that by writing your code in a good way, you will make your code understandable. For example, if you return after a break, or after a few weeks, or when handing your code over to someone else. It's also important so that you can minimize your time spent on coding and focus more on getting results, or at least the deeper insights from your results. And it's also good so you can keep track of who's responsible for what part of the code. So how can this be achieved? Here I, here I will give you an overview and I will follow with examples shortly. So you should try to indent your code, you should comment your code well, you should try to use logical names on all variables and functions, you should try to keep things simple, don't repeat code, use loops and make functions instead, and try to keep your functions as slim as possible. Uh, you should also try to make the functions universal. And you should try to anticipate solve errors while you're coding, and you should always code in small segments. And of course you should know when to deviate from these rules. And now I will give you some examples of these concepts. So I will start by with talking about indenting. So here is an example that creates random data and checks if an element is equal to zero. And if it is, it looks for the lowest number in the data that is not equal to zero and replaces it. The function then calculates standard deviations and mean values based on the modified data. But as you can see, this code is quite hard to understand. But if you look uh, at it this, in this, this way, when I have indented it, you can see that it's much easier to understand. So just indenting makes the code much easier to see. It's still not perfect, but it's easier. And you can s clearly see how the loops are running and f uh, what parts are inside another loop. Uh, and this can be done super easily in MATLAB. Just mark your code and press Ctrl and I. And there's really no reason not to do this. It makes your code much easier to understand and it's it takes zero effort. So the next step is commenting. So this can also tremendously help with understanding your code, especially if you haven't written it yourself. So compare this code to the left to this on the right. Here I have inserted many, many comments, and some of these might be actually too many, but it can give you a, a clearer overview of what the function actually does. So it's always better to make too much comments than to make too few, because if you come from not having to done anything in the, in the function and then you're supposed to be understanding it, it could be quite hard if there are no comments at all in the in the functions. So always try to make good comments. Okay, moving on to the next concept, avoiding repetitive code. So if you look at these few lines, these loop over all columns, and you can think of the columns as time points if you like, and then it calculates the mean values and their standard deviations. And this is just four lines, so it's it's really not much code at all. But if you would have done this in a repetitive way instead, it would look something like this. So then you would take the mean value and the standard deviation for the first column and then the second and then the third and etc. etc. And really the left version is just much more easy to use than the right one, isn't it? I think we can agree on that. Okay, so let's continue and talk about how to simplify functions. So here's the full example again. Uh, this code can actually be simplified quite a lot. And I will go through this simplification step by step. So first look at these lines. What they do is that they find the lowest value in the data that is not equal to zero. And it does this by uh, creating first a variable d that is a large number. And then compares d to all elements in the matrix. And if the element being checked is lower than d, d is replaced by the element. A much easier way of doing this would just be to find all indexes that are, uh, have values that are greater than zero, and then selecting the minimum of all these values that are non-zero. So let's just replace the code with this. Ah, much better. 
We should have a note that we only need to do this once and we can therefore move these lines out of the loops. So let's do that. Okay, so now I will just remove some of the uh, blank lines so you can see the code uh, in a clearer way. Otherwise the code is exactly the same. Okay, so if you look at the code now, you can see that it's still more complex than it has to be. For example, these lines here. What they do is they find the elements that are equal to zero and then replaces them with the minimum value that we got earlier. And this can actually be also be done in a much easier way. So if you look at this code, all we need to do is to find the indexes of all elements that are equal to zero and then replace all of these uh, with the minimum value. So there you have it, two lines instead of seven, no loops. Great, let's replace it. Uh, let's also remove some of the blank lines again, so we can get a clear overview. And again, the code is exactly the same. It's just a little restructured. So I think you get the point now. So let's continue with the next step, using appropriate names for the functions and variables. So at the current state of the code, all variables have rather bad names. None really say what kind of information the variable contains. So, for example, look at these variables. Uh, having them named A, B, and C is not really informative at all. More appropriate names could be, for example, this. So let's call A raw data and B call, we call it mean values and call C can be standard deviation values. So let's replace them. There we go. Better. But as you can see, there are still more variables that have non-informative names, so let's replace them as well. So we can take these and replace them with better names. There we go. Now all variables have good names. So now that the code is easily to easy to understand with good names and informative commenting, it's time to move on to the next step. And that is to keep the, the function slim. And we should try to have the function just do a single task. So if you look here, what we do with these lines of code is that we replace all zero values, values in the data with the lowest value greater than zero. And this can easily be made into its own function. So let's make it into a function and move it away from the rest of the code and insert a function call instead. See? Much easier to see and understand. So again, now I'll restructure the code a bit for the next step and it's still exactly the same. Okay, so if we analyze the code a bit further, you can actually see that there are another part of the code that can easily be made into a separate function. And what most of the code does right now, besides fixing the data that we moved out earlier, is to calculate the mean and standard deviation values. So if I just move these lines down, we can make this part of the code into a separate function as well, and keep the calculations done in a separate function. So let's make this into a function and again move it down and replace it with a function call. Great! And now I will we'll restructure the uh, script again. Still exactly the same code. And as you can see now, the code have good names, they are co it is commented in an informative way, and have functions, each with a clear purpose. However, if you look at the functions, they are still not perfect. So let's have a closer look. And as you can see, there are constants present in the code. This is most often a bad idea. Almost all the time that you have constants in your code, you can get it from something else in the code. Let's say that you want, might want to do some operations on all rows in the matrix, then you should most likely get your constant from the size of the matrix, instead of having a uh, defined constant. So this is actually what we want to do here. In this case, we calculate mean values and standard deviation values from the number of columns in the data. And you can think about this as having one value for each time point, if you like. Uh, in this example, the data have eight time points. <laughs> However, this might change if we get data for more time points, or if we have to drop one time point, or so on. So instead of using a constant, we can define a variable as the width of the matrix. That way, we can handle all matrix sizes with the same function. So let's just replace, replace it with uh, the number of points equal to the size of the data. And now we have one function that can handle all sizes of data, or input data. Uh, and for the next step, I will use the fixed data function as an example. 
and now we will talk about handling and anticipating errors. So errors, as you might know by now, are those anno annoying red lines you get in MATLAB when something goes wrong. Sometimes it's possible to keep running the code despite the errors you might get, and in our case it's quite common for a single simulation to crash for numerical reasons, and in this case we want to just ignore those parameters and to keep running the optimization. And this can be done by inserting a try-catch block. And what this does is that it tests the code in the try part, which is referred to as a statement. If the try statement fails, the catch statement will be executed. If, however, the try statement does not fail, the script will just continue past the catch statement without running any of the lines. Sometimes it can be a good idea to still see the error message but without having your script stop. And you can do this in MATLAB by giving the error a name and then displaying it. And this is done in this way. So here we catch the error and we call it error. And then we display the, the error message with the line that says disp get report error. And this is fair, very useful. So, avoiding errors. Well, the best way of handling errors is of course not to get them. But this can be hard to achieve. A better way is to know how to find them early on. And this is the reason why you should try to code in small pieces and debug your code continuously. Uh, if you write 300 lines of code and then test if it works, you will most likely have a hard time finding the source of any problems in your code. And you should also try to think about possible errors that can occur, and if they can be avoided in any way. And common examples of errors are wrong matrix sizes, empty variables, and giving too few inputs to a function. The last thing I will talk about is deviating from these rules and I will just leave this slide empty because knowing when to deviate from the rules requires experience. But as an example, if you know that you are only going to manipulate a matrix once, you probably don't need to make a script with sub-functions and comments and good names, you can just do it once and then throw away the script. But then again, this takes practice. Okay, do you have any questions? If you do, you are more than welcome to contact me in any way that's easy for you. Uh, otherwise, I hope that you have learned something from this video, and I hope that all your code will be perfect from now on. Good luck!